Hello, uh, this is Ramzi Sanver. Uh, I am a research professor at the French Scientific National Research Center. Uh, my research is on um, applied mathematics. Mathematics applied to social sciences, social, social sciences. On the other hand, uh, I am a Freemason since uh, 30 years. I am a member of the Grand Lodge of Turkey. In fact, I have also been the Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Turkey between 2010 and 2013. And I'm also interested in uh, research into uh, Freemasonry. And I am truly honored uh, to present uh, this paper uh, at uh, the Quattro Coronati uh, Lodge. Uh, the paper is joint work with uh, my brother Yavuz Aolu, who is a distinguished uh, historian uh, on Turkish uh, Freemasonry. And in fact, the paper is also uh, forthcoming at uh, AQC. And as the title implies, uh, the paper uh, is about uh, the uh, foundation of the Ottoman Grand East uh, in uh, 1909, uh, which is in fact today's Grand Lodge of uh, Turkey. And this foundation is an interesting uh, story. Uh, it's Freemasonry uh, mixed uh, with politics, uh, mixed with uh, religion, uh, as it's the case in many uh, instances. So uh, I will try to uh, describe uh, this interesting story and also uh, present uh, some findings uh, that we reached uh, throughout our analysis uh, with uh, Yavuz. So I will be starting by uh, presenting the structure of my uh, talk. In fact, uh, I will devote some short moments for an overview of the Ottoman Empire. Because uh, from what I have observed in France, uh, I would say the Ottoman Empire is undertowed uh, in uh, France and probably in several other in several other countries. So in that sense, I will be starting by uh, giving a brief uh, description and overview of what the Ottoman Empire was, and then uh, I will give some highlights on uh, Freemasonry in the Ottoman uh, Empire. And after this background information, I will present the thesis of the paper, what we are arguing uh, here. And next, uh, as the thesis of the paper is quite connected to the relationship between uh, politics and Freemasonry in the Ottoman Empire, I will give some uh, brief account of uh, that relationship, which is also uh, some kind of a background information. And finally, uh, I will come to the core of the paper, this part expressed in bold there. So understanding the Ottoman Grand East, so here is our new findings and here is our thesis. Uh, I will talk about the foundation of the Ottoman Grand East, about its founders, about the founding documents. And with all this, I think I will be able to support uh, the thesis of the paper, which I will be reiterating. And finally, I will be closing uh, with some uh, final remarks. And I, I hope all this in no longer than uh, 30 minutes. So. Uh, let me start uh, with an overview of the uh, Ottoman uh, Empire. The Ottoman Empire uh, is a Turkish state uh, run by the uh, Ottoman, uh, ruled by the Ottoman uh, dynasty. Ottoman is the name of the founder, Osman in Turkish. And this uh, state uh, has been founded in uh, the third end of 13th century, 1299 at Bursa, uh, which is at uh, Western Turkey today, uh, a city which is close to the Dardanelles. And in 1299, uh, it has been founded as a tiny uh, state, but which grew up uh, and became an empire in uh, two centuries. One of the important developments uh, is the conquest of Istanbul in 1453, in the 15th century. Uh, which led to the collapse of the Roman Empire. And when we come at the 16th uh, century, uh, mid 16th century, we see a huge empire, one of the biggest empires in the history. So in Europe, uh, its limits go to Vienna, uh, the whole Balkans, the whole Middle East, uh, almost whole North Africa, except Morocco southern part of Europe, so the Mediterranean, which becomes an almost uh, Ottoman uh, vassal. So it became a, a huge uh, empire. And this empire, interestingly, culturally between the East and the West. 
So it's very influenced by Islam uh, because uh, the ruling dynasty, the Ottomans uh, are Muslim. Uh, highest, uh, mo many parts of the population are Muslim, but it's also has its face turned to Europe, relations with Europe. And it should be noted that its capital, Istanbul, since the 15th century, uh, was the capital of the Roman uh, Empire. So you see, really see a cultural mixture of the East and the West, which is, I think, beautifully expressed still today in this uh, lovely city of Istanbul, which is uh, placed uh, in Europe and in Asia uh, at the uh, same uh, time. Well, <sighs> This having been uh, said, uh, the good days of the empire uh, start to end uh, at the 16th century, and the empire uh, starts a fall down. And uh, basically, it misses the Enlightenment uh, period. And in the 17th century, 18th century, well, they see that Europe is doing well, uh, but the empire is not doing well. So there is this idea of westernization. So import institutions from Europe, which is performing uh, better, much better than the Ottoman uh, Empire. So this is an idea uh, which exists in the empire, I would say by the end of the 17th century, uh, which is quite visible in the 18th uh, century, uh, the westernization idea. However, the strong political movement which supports this idea is the Young Turks movement, uh, by the mid 19th uh, century, uh, which has its own political party, which is called the Union and Progress uh, Party. And uh, the Union and Progress Party is the Ottoman elite uh, impressed by the values of the French uh, Republic and who wants, uh, who wants uh, really to modernize the Ottoman state in every aspect. And also they have a political project. The political project is to replace the absolute monarchy by a constitutional parliamentary monarchy. So we will hear a lot, we will refer a lot to the Union and Progress uh, and the Young Turks movement as they are very much intertwined with Freemasonry in the Ottoman Empire, as I will explain soon. So basically this is about the Ottoman Empire. And now I wish to give uh, some highlights on Freemasonry in the Ottoman Empire. Well. We see lodges uh, over the territory of the uh, empire, uh, even uh, at the first part of the 18th century, that early. Uh, these are under European Grand Lodges, uh, mostly England and Scotland. And their members are diplomats, merchants, expats, but mainly locals are not accepted. So they don't interfere with uh, Ottoman uh, citizens or Ottoman subjects to be uh, technically uh, correct. Uh, and basically uh, they are lodges for the uh, expats. So this is what we call with Yavuz the colonial period. So there is Freemasonry uh, under European Grand Lodges, mostly England, Scotland, uh, but Freemasonry is not for the locals, but they are uh, for uh, the expats, which are in the Ottoman empire for a temporary uh, period. And to be noted, when I say locals are not accepted, not only Muslims, but non-Muslims are also not basically accepted. So the idea is not to interfere with the uh, locals. And then comes uh, the second period. And this is, I would say, by uh, mid uh, 19th uh, century until 1909, which is the foundation of the Ottoman Grand. Uh, and there in this period, we see lodges and mostly continental European lodges, Grand Orient de France, uh, Grand Oriente d'Italia, uh, Grand Oriente Espanol, well, they start to initiate locals. So the initiation of Ottoman citizens uh, or subjects uh, to uh, Freemasonry and systematically uh, starts uh, by the mid of uh, 19th uh, century. And I will come to this soon, this is where Freemasonry uh, meets Ottoman politics because the first initiates uh, locals, Ottoman uh, citizens, well, they are uh, a lot involved with this political movement of union and progress, which I will explain soon. And to be noted, there is still no national Grand Lodge, 
the National Grand Lodge, uh, the first National Grand Lodge, the Ottoman Grandees, will be founded in 1909. And our paper basically concentrates on this second period, which we call the cosmopolitan opposition period. It is cosmopolitan uh, because it, in, it incorporates uh, Christians and Muslims and Jews in the Ottoman Empire connected to Europe. And it's the opposition period because in this period, Freemasonry is used as a tool to oppose the absolute monarchy and to replace it with a constitutional one. So basically, uh, the paper elaborates uh, this uh, second period, which we call the cosmopolitan opposition uh, period. And now let me tell the thesis of our paper. So the thesis of the paper is the following. We claim that the establishment of the Ottoman grandees in 1909, which is a consequence of this cosmopolitan opposition period, is a conscious design which aims an institution of secular spirituality. And this is a project whose roots is not purely Masonic, but also is in the political environment of the Ottoman Empire. So this is what we will be arguing. And for the rest of my talk, I will try to elaborate uh, these uh, arguments to support this uh, thesis. So now uh, I will tell a few words. This is also uh, common knowledge, background information, but I think it's important for the paper. Uh, some background information about uh, how Freemasonry met politics in the Ottoman Empire. As I said, the initiation of the locals uh, start uh, by the second half of the uh, 19th uh, century. And uh, of course, uh, then uh, this was the intellectual elite. And these were individuals in the Ottoman Empire impressed uh, by the ideas of the French Revolution, liberté, égalité, fraternité, freedom, equality, brotherhood, justice, and progress. And as such, uh, Freemasonry attracted the intellectual class, which was a handful after all in the Ottoman Empire uh, from every uh, origin. And even for example, the Crown Prince Murat has been a Freemason uh, who later became, uh, became the Sultan uh, Murat V. And you can imagine the enthusiasm this created. So the Sultan of the Ottomans, who is also the Caliph of the Muslims, uh, who is a Freemason. So really the intellectual class uh, was attracted uh, by uh, Freemason. And I would say uh, mostly uh, they were initiated at Thessaloniki because Istanbul was the capital uh, and uh, towards the end of the 19th century, uh, the Sultan Abdul Hamid, Abdul Hamid was unhappy with Freemasons because he saw them uh, as a threat to the absolute uh, monarchy, which was politically uh, true. Uh, so it wasn't easy to meet at Thessaloniki. Uh, so mostly the lodges uh, were meeting, it wasn't easy to meet at Istanbul. So mostly the lodges were meeting at Thessaloniki, uh, far from the capital, uh, which is today's Greece. This is the town where Atatürk is, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk is uh, born. Uh, so it was a very uh, intellectually lively town of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, so mostly lodges, you see Masonic activities at Thessaloniki. Uh, and there you see lodges are from uh, Spain, from France, uh, from uh, Italy. And this is where uh, Freemasonry and uh, the Young Turks movement, the Union and Progress Party uh, cross each other. And one can say that uh, at the end of the 19th century, Freemasonry becomes an important element of the opposing Union and Progress Party. To be sure, this doesn't mean that uh, every member of the Union and Progress was a Freemason, uh, or nor uh, every Freemason had to be uh, a member of the Union and Progress, but clearly the two movements, Freemasonry and the Union and Progress, were going hand to hand, I would say. Another point to be noted, and which is, I think, important, all these social and state reform projects of the Ottoman Empire were led sure by local dynamic, dynamics, but also there was pressure from Europe, from foreign countries for these reforms. And as such, European Freemasonry 
Freemasonry become a link to the Union and Progress to Europe. Because while well, the members of the Union and Progress uh, were uh, members of European uh, lodges, and uh, they were uh, Freemasonry was in fact a tool to connect them to the politics in uh, Europe uh, as well. Uh, and with all these relationships, this political uh, project succeeds. And uh, in 1908, in 1908. After all, uh, the Union and Progress succeeds in the sense that uh, the absolute monarchy is replaced uh, by a constitutional parliamentary monarchy, which leads Union and Progress to come to power in the elected parliament. So this is what we can observe as a background. And all these processes leads to the foundation of the Ottoman Grand East in 1909. So right after the parliamentary monarchy, well, the Ottoman Grand East is founded with the existing lodges, not all, but many of the existing lodges over the Ottoman territory. And this can truly be seen as really the crowning of this cosmopolitan opposition, which uh, politics exacerbated uh, through uh, free uh, Mason. And here comes an observation that we find with Yavuz uh, very interesting. When you look at the constitution, the bylaws and rituals of the Ottoman Grand East, you see that the terminology, mostly the terminology is not adopted from classical Freemasonry, but from the Sufi orders of Islam that exhibit similarities to Freemasonry. So here I would like to open a parenthesis. Uh, in Islam, there are several Sufi orders, uh, fraternities, which are based on a culture of symbolism. And obviously this creates a common ground uh, for these orders and Freemasonry. And when you look many of those orders like the Mevlevi order, the turning dervishes, like the Bektashi order, you see a strong cultural closeness uh, and also similarities in ritual practices uh, to uh, Freemasonry. Uh, so the similarities are really visible. And interestingly, uh, the first conceptual background of the Ottoman Grand East uses the terminology of these Sufi orders. For example, uh, they don't say Scottish right, but they say the Scottish tariqat. Tariqat means the path, and this is the name given to these Sufi orders. So they don't call it a ritual, but they call it a ayin, and ayin is the name given uh, to uh, the rituals of those uh, Sufi orders. Even the naming of the institution, for example, in today's Turkish, there is no specific Turkish word for Freemasonry. Uh, in Turkish, to say Freemason, we use the French word, we say mason. So in Turkish, when you say Mason, it means a Freemason. However, in 1909, uh, the French word uh, was not used, although uh, these intellectuals were very much impressed by France, but they used the word Bani, which means uh, erector in some mystical uh, context. So basically, uh, in our paper, we observe uh, the adoption of the terminology of Sufi orders to express, to conceptually express uh, Freemasonry. Well, of course, now one can ask, well, whether the founders uh, of the Ottoman Grand East uh, were trying to uh, transform Freemasonry into a new modern, I would say, Islamic fraternity. And we answer this question uh, negatively. And the negative answer lies uh, in uh, the identities of the founders of the Ottoman Grand East. So I will give uh, some attention to this. First of all, the founders of the Ottoman Grand East really represented the Ottoman intellectual elite. And as I said, it was a handful uh, at that uh, time. So all intellectual elite uh, of the empire, what, well, not everyone, but mostly uh, they were. Uh, within uh, this uh, processes of founding the Ottoman uh, Grand East. And all the founders, uh, they were experienced Freemasons uh, raised in different European Grand Lodge. They, they knew what Freemasonry is. 
So when you look at their story of initiation in which lodges they work, uh, you can clearly claim that uh, they knew what Freemasonry uh, is. And furthermore, well, among uh, the founders, they were Muslims, but several of them were non-Muslims. So there were Jews, there were Armenians, there were Greeks. So one cannot really, it doesn't really make sense to think that all these people with that background uh, would aim to organize a new Islamic fraternity uh, under an institution uh, with very clear modernist uh, tendencies. So if so, what was the point of using this uh, Islamic uh, terminology? Well, there uh, we have to look at the uh, founding uh, documents of uh, the uh, Ottoman Grand East. And when you look at these documents, you see a very open, explicit will uh, of the Union and Progress Party to organize Freemasonry over the whole Ottoman territory according to its political intentions. So there is this explicit aim of founding new lodges in Egypt, in Syria, in uh, Lebanon. So, so there is this idea of bringing Freemasonry uh, to the Ottoman territory, to the unaccessed, Masonically unaccessed parts of the Ottoman territory, and also combine this uh, with the political project of the Union and uh, Progress. And of course, that territory to which Freemasonry uh, was to be brought uh, is a Muslim geography. So it was obvious that the founders of the Union and Progress realized that Freemasonry can be defined as an institution of secular spirituality. And if it is expressed with these terms of the Islamic fraternities, which the local people already knew, well, it will be much more welcome in these parts of the world. And when we, we look at these documents uh, regarding the foundation of the Ottoman Grand East, you really clearly see this conscience design aiming uh, to facilitate the expansion of Freemasonry over the Ottoman uh, territory. Well, there is a beautiful book by Thierry Zarkon, uh, Le Croissant et le Compas, The Crescent and the Compass, where it gives uh, examples, it presents instances, not only in the Ottoman territory, uh, but in the whole Muslim geography, where Freemasonry was first received through this uh, Sufi uh, orders. So this was, I think, uh, we think a clear uh, point uh, in this project, in this Masonic and political project of uh, the Union and Progress. So uh, we, think that the Ottoman Grand East interpreted Freemasonry as a tradition of spirituality, but of secular spirituality, uh, which it expressed by exploiting the terminology of Sufism. Well, here I wish to make three remarks. One is that very obviously the design of this new institution has benefited from the closeness cultural similarities or predispositions between Freemasonry and the Sufis fraternities of Islam. Well, second, among the first Freemasons of the Ottoman Empire, the Muslim ones, uh, well, they mostly belong to the Sufi tradition. They were Melami, they were Mevlevi, they were Bektashi. So the Muslim Freemasons came from the Sufi tradition. Uh, and the third remark that we wish to make is the following. Uh, as I mentioned uh, a moment ago, well, this is an era uh, where Freemasonry contacted Islam, not only in the Ottoman Empire, but in several other parts of the Muslim uh, geography. And as Thierry Zarkon mentions in his book, uh, in other parts of this Muslim geography also, Freemasonry was expressed with Islamic terminology. For example, the term tariqat was used, ayin was used. But in the case of the Ottoman Grand East, this relation was not only regarding the cultural closeness between the Islamic fraternities and Freemasonry, but also it had a political uh, background, a political background which supported the political mission of the union and progress. Well, as a result, uh, with all these arguments, 
I wish to reiterate our thesis, which is the following. The establishment of the Ottoman Grandees in 1909 can be seen as a conscious design aiming an institution of secular spirituality, a project whose roots can be found in the political environment of the Ottoman Empire. Well, I will close with some final remarks. First of all, I think we can say that as every design risks to gradually evolve into a different direction when it's put into practice, uh, this has been the case for the Ottoman Grand East, uh, which found itself in the midst of wars and political uh, troubles. Uh, the First uh, World War uh, has been uh, catastrophic uh, for the Ottoman Empire, for the Union and Progress, for its political project, and also for the Ottoman Grand uh, East. And the political project of the Union and Progress uh, was shakily defeated. And uh, well, this idea of the cosmopolitan opposition uh, was renunciated. And this resulted in fact into a non-cosmopolitan state with almost uh, no opposition by the end of the uh, First World uh, War. And uh, well, this led of course to the gradual diminution of the weight of non-Muslims in Ottoman Freemasonry. However, this did not result in an increase in Sufi influences because, well, at the end of the First World War in 1923, the Turkish Republic, the secular Turkish Republic was founded uh, by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. And the uncompromising secular character of the Republic of Turkey uh, seems to have managed to suppress the rise of possible Sufist approach within Turkish Freemasonry. However, However, this culture still prevailed. And even when you look at the Grand Lodge of Turkey today, uh, which has been founded in 1909, the name of Grand Lodge of Turkey was taken in 1923 with the Republic. And even when you look at the Grand Lodge, the culture, the Masonic culture of the Grand Lodge of Turkey today, within the secular picture of today, you still see what we call with Yavuz a kind of shy Sufism, uh, which is inherited to the cultural codes of Turkish Freemasons. Thank you very much for your attention.